And welcome to Voices of Truth, one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's future, brought to you by the Kiwani Foundation. I'm Ehu K. Kahu Cardwell, and here we are today in Honolulu. We've got a wonderful guest for you to meet, so let's go over and say hi to her. Marty, aloha. Aloha. Nice to meet you. Nice welcome to, meet to you. Voices of Truth, Marty Townsend. Nice. And Marty, we wanted to have you on the show because you work for a great organization called Kahea, mm -hmm. which that's Hawaiian for the, the, the call. The call. Mm -hmm. It's like put the call out to get people to come, right? Yeah, um, most commonly people know it uh, when you see hula dancers dancing in a troupe of halau, uh -huh. and uh, one dancer will call out a Kahea, and, and all of the, the dancers will know, you know, to what to, what to, what, do, next. What to do next, basically, right. to prepare themselves, right? right. But your organization so. is not about dancing or hula. Well. You guys dance to a little different tune, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's all about, uh, the work that we do is about um, protecting the resources um, and the rights that allow cultural practitioners like hula dancers to do the things that they do. Really? Wow. That's, that's very much needed here in Hawaii. Yes. How long have you been with Kahea? I've been with Kahea since 2005. Wow, so About good, good amount of time. Three years, yes. Yeah, and what what made you want to go to work for them? What attracted you to so look? That's wow. This is something I want to do. Uh, well, um, it, Kahea has a platform uh, where we work to get people involved in public decision making using um, technology such as. Um, uh, email alerts. Yep, I and know, so I've got some of them. You've gotten some of them. So, yeah. so when I was in school, I was an Action Alert member and I participated in a, a lot of the online actions and yep. I felt really inspired uh, by that whole process. I knew that they needed um, help and so after I graduated from law school, I applied. Wow, so you're trained as an attorney. Yes. And it sounds to me, based on what you just said, Marty, like you were inspired because you saw that when you give grassroots people some put some give them some power they can actually make a difference and better people's lives yeah. yes yes yeah so Kahea I, I know you know some of the uh, emails I've gotten from Kahea is about in the environment yes about cultural practices like you yes. said but you know the the um, the notices have been hey we need your help mm -hmm. because something's about to happen to right. compromise or damage the environment right something a law is about to be passed to compromise exactly. Hawaiian cultural practice uh, practices and rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're, we're basically a watchdog organization. We keep an eye on the state legislature, on the Department of Land Natural Resources, Land Use Commission, um, all, all of those different kinds of government entities that make decisions that affect uh, the environment and cultural access rights. Wow. So uh, share with us, if you would, exactly what you do for Kahia. Uh, I'm the program director, so I uh, I do a lot of the actual watchdogging. I attend the hearings. Uh -huh. uh, I write up notes from the meetings, and I follow decision making. And when I see something that uh, is coming up that I think is going to have a detrimental effect to to cultural practitioners in Hawaii, I put the call out. Kahe was formed in 2000. Um, it grew out of the Senate Bill 8 fight, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Yes, uh, but some of our viewers may not be, so give them a brief recap. <laughs> we have viewers all over the world. They're going to be sitting there going, what is she talking about? So in, in, in 1996, uh, there uh, was a, a huge effort to prevent um, a, an, uh, an initiative on the state level to cut off access rights for cultural practitioners to natural resources. So, so that, that, if that had happened, that meant that Native Hawaiians could not go up into forests and gather things they need for, the, for hula, for medicinal purposes. They couldn't have access to the beach if they had to cross maybe some private property to, to gain access to, to particular kinds of foods and whatnot, right? Right, so... so uh, in other words, Hawaiians couldn't be Hawaiians. Basically, uh, Haw yeah. Hawaiians have, cultural practitioners have, uh, culturally, uh, constitutionally protected rights to access. Uh, for gathering purposes, and uh, the Senate Bill 8 was an attempt to um, at least uh, regulate that Confine more. Confine that. Confine it. Yeah. So it would be things like issuing a permit and stuff like yeah. and, and things like that. And it was, so it was possible that some cultural practitioners would be denied those practices. And, and also part of the, the relationship between the people and the land is that you have, uh, it's an open and free relationship, right? It's not to be regulated and, and, and mediated by, by the state government. Well, it's you know? not the Hawaiian way for starters. It's not the Hawaiian way for starters, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so out, out of that um, fight, which really brought a lot of people's attention to um, the struggles faced in Hawaii's environment uh, and, our, and our culture, 
the, um, a lot of environmentalists and cultural practitioners came together and, and prior to that they'd really been pitted against each other, they, 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 their interests weren't aligned. And it, and, after getting to know each other, we realized actually um, environmental protection and, and Native Hawaiian cultural practice go hand in hand. And so they formed a coalition, an, an alliance, and that's why we're called the Hawaiian Environmental Alliance. We work on issues that intersect between um, environmental protection and, and, and cultural issues. You know, I really love what you just said. I always love hearing this, which is <laughs> a bunch of people got together and we discovered that we have a lot more in common mm. than, than, than in what we differ. Yes. Yeah. So out of this thing that was going to happen, that was going to be bad, this bill being passed, a very good thing happened, mm. that Kahia mm -hmm. was born. Yes. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. So what happened next? Well, the, one of the first initiatives that Kahia took on was um, the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. Northwest Hawaiian Islands, yep. And uh, worked very hard for protections um, on a federal and state level. Um, and it's been, uh, it's been a tough battle, many, many years. Uh, but we were successful in at least getting the place set aside. So in the state waters are the most protected uh, in the Northern Swan Islands. Uh, and it still protects cultural access. So uh, people who um, want to go up to the Northern Swan Islands for cultural access um, are allowed to do so. But we also protect the area from cultural or from commercial extraction, yeah. uh, from unnecessary research, from tourism. Uh, and we're still working with the federal government on that level. As I'm sure most people know, the North Hawaiian Islands were set aside as the Papahanaumoku Akea Marine National Monument. Right. And it's been um, a struggle to help the federal government to see that this, the mission of the monument should not be tourism and <laughs> experimentation. So uh, <laughs> they also are, are allowing uh, or, or not fully regulating uh, military use of the area as well. So. Um, we're still working with the federal government to get them to see the importance of doing that. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I, I, I hear every now and then is some people are surprised that the Hawaiian Islands go that far. And when uh -huh. I tell them, well, wait a minute, Hawaiian Islands, it's the largest archipelago on Earth. They go, yes, you've got to be kidding. Because most people think it's just Kauai, Oahu, Maui, mm. Hawaii, you know, Lanai, Molokai, and, and yeah. some people know about Nihau. Mm. But that's just the populated islands. The right. rest of it goes how many thousands of miles up um, there? It's 1,200 miles. 1,200 miles. We have atolls. Some of them are seasonal. Right. Um, you know, sandbars as well as full-blown islands. Right. So. But these are. Th this is a place up there that a lot of, of marine life, as well as birds and sea monks and mm -hmm. seals and. And, and all kinds of stuff depend on for sustenance, otherwise they couldn't exist, right? Right, we're they talking about, about 7,000 species. Se wow! 7, so seabirds, um, uh, corals, marine mammals, right. so there, there's a wide variety of species up there and, and, and it's the last predator dominated ecosystem. Um, one of the last in the marine environment, and so what we, does that mean? The, one of the last predator dominant. That means that this is the this is one of the last examples of a fully functional marine uh, marine ecosystem. So where you have we have the sharks on the top, the top predators, right? Jacks, ulua, and then you have the entire food chain beneath that. And that's actually very rare to find these days because in a lot of cases um, those those kinds of ecosystems have been overfished. Yes, I was just going to say, it's the last one that hasn't been messed with, is what right. I mean. It's so, still intact. Right. Amazing. And, and, and you know, other ecosystems like that have also been challenged by other um, environmental harms, you know, sure. runoff, pollution, military exercises. All that man-made stuff. Exactly. Yep. So, so we have a op real opportunity in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands to see how a functional um, marine ecosystem is supposed to be working and, and work to make that happen here as well. I mean, you, we have to keep in mind that the main islands were once like the North Hawaiian Islands, and, yeah. that, and that's partly the reason why Hawaiians are so successful in, in living off the land and as a subsistence living. And part of the challenge is to, to recreate that environment so that we can actually have food sovereignty and, and independence in a true and meaningful way. You know, I mean, it may sound, I mean, Hawaiians did it right. <laughs> they had it right. It was an eco, it was a balanced ecosystem. They didn't need to bring in anything from the outside, mm. ship anything from a foreign country mm. like they do now or from mm. the U.S., from America. And how is it, how, how could things get so messed up that everything is so flipped around? Well, um, my personal opinion, it was commerce, commercial activity. It was exploitation of our natural resources for profit, profit. Is, is really what drove um, 
the sandalwood trade and sugar cane, yep. pineapple, all and of the overthrow. And the overthrow. And the overthrow. Tariffs. Yes, get rid the of the sugar. tariffs, the yep. sugar tariffs, exactly. Yep. So these are all examples of profit driving decision making and not necessarily the best interest of the individual or, or the community at large. Wow, that's yeah. really amazing. So what do you think can be learned now that we have that area protected? What mm -hmm. can that area teach us? And do you think we're going to be smart enough to listen? <laughs> That, that, that is the challenge for the, for, for the next phase of this. Now that, now that it's protected, we need to make sure that the, those with the kuleana to, to actually manage this place do it well. So that's part of our um, kuleana is, is watchdogging that and making sure that the people who put their name towards protecting this place and thousands and thousands of people signed petitions, testimony consistently over seven, eight years to make this happen. So we're accountable to them and uh, we want to work to make sure that federal and state government officials do what they're supposed to do to make sure this place is well managed. And, and that's the trick is that we're developing curriculum, uh, helping to uh, better understand this area, encourage cultural access to, to learn the history and the connections between the islands. And, and with that information, hopefully we can uh, and make things better for the future. I heard curriculum in there. Does that mean like you, 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 you design curriculums for the schools to educate them about this area? We, d we develop some educational materials. We're also encouraging um, the federal and state governments to do that as well. They have programs that they use to help develop materials based on uh, what we know of the North Hawaiian Islands and what we can learn and maybe apply and adapt uh -huh. here. What are some of the current issues that you guys <laughs> at Kahea are working on right now? Well, the legislative session for the state of Hawaii um, begins in January, and so we're, there are several initiatives that are um, under consideration, not all of them good. Mm -hmm. um, the good ones are, um, one is to, pr to protect uh, taro from genetic modification. Taro is a traditional food source uh, for Native Hawaiians, and <clears throat> the University of Hawaii together with Monsanto and several other uh, companies are trying to genetically modify it for different disease resistances. That's a big no-no. <laughs> yes, it's a huge problem because for Hawaiians, like many indigenous people, they feel they have a genetic connection to, an ancestral connection to taro. Yes. Yes. So to modify it, it's like asking you if you genetically modified your grandmother, are you guys still related? You know, yeah, it's, it's, exactly. it's a fundamental question that's, that's very offensive. Yes. And the university and the corporations have really showed a lack of cultural sensitivity. They're also very concerned about the public safety of these activities. Uh, there's been no long-term study on, on, on what, <laughs> you know, the side effects. Is exactly. Like yeah. Exactly. And, yeah. And, and also the University of Hawaii has um, unfortunately a notorious history for not uh, being as uh, protective and secure and safe as it could be. And yes. so we're concerned about the labs where these things are being con conducted. We're really advocating for a precautionary approach to decision making as far as allowing this kind of research to go forward because once we flip this switch, once we open this door, there is yeah. no closing it. And yeah. so we want to be incredibly cautious about the decisions that we make affecting this very fundamental aspect of Hawaiian culture. Mm -hmm. In addition, we're also working on improving public access, um, Maukatumakai. Uh, there's been some challenges to shoreline access from private property owners. And while we recognize that it's, people have, do have private property interests, those need to be balanced against uh, the public's constitutional right to access these areas. The needs of the individual balanced against the needs of society. Exactly. In this case, the whole Native Hawaiian culture. Right. And that's Malcolm <laughs> Makai's ocean to the mountain, mountain to the ocean. Exactly. Yep. So, uh, you know, the, the shoreline, the, the beaches in Hawaii are all public and protected. Mm -hmm. and. It's a challenge sometimes, in, in, especially in, very, in more developed areas, to get to the shoreline, uh, which makes a de facto private beach for the beachfront owners. Yes, yes. <laughs> And it also negatively affects uh, cultural practices. People ha um, lose the rights and the abilities to access these areas. They lose the um, experience, the connection, the relationship to the area. And, and, and that's how Hawaiian culture atrophies. Yep. So we're working with, with the state legislature to try to prevent that. 
Wow, that's really great. So for, for, for many years, we've been working to, with Mauna Kea Aina Ho and protecting the sacred summit of Mauna Kea. Uh, yes, yes, yes. And we've yes. actually been very, very successful. Mauna Kea Aina Ho um, have launched uh, a, court, a court battle against the University of Hawaii and their development um, of telescopes on the summit. Yes. And uh, um, unfortunately now, instead of trying to follow the law, because Mauna Kea Aina Ho actually won the lawsuit and the university lost, and instead of the university following the law, they are now advocating for it to be changed. So we'll be in the we'll be at the state legislature this year, also working to protect Mauna Kea from from further development. You know what you call that a sore loser. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's it, it's quite it's quite a challenge. You know, the University of Hawaii reaps um, immense value from the summit, yeah. and uh, none of it is is expressed to the community. You know, they pay one dollar a rent, one dollar a year in rent. One dollar a year in rent, and yeah. what do they get from it? Exactly, they get they have a world famous. Um, incredibly valuable astronomy program. Um, they get to sell all the data and research that's done there. They get to sell telescope time. And the thing is, is that they work with foreign companies and foreign institutions, educational institutions. They pay them millions of dollars, no yeah. doubt. Yes to, to, yes, to build these actual telescopes. Mm -hmm. And in exchange, the University of Hawaii gets to ride their coattails. Right. And so we, um, it's not that we are advocating that if we, if the University of Hawaii paid more rent, the telescopes would be okay, but yeah. rather that of the, you know, 50 plus telescopes and support structures that are up there, uh, we need some back rent. The Native Hawaiians have really been denied access to these pu'u that have been flattened for the telescopes, and, and there needs to be some reparations for that. Yeah. Um, well, the other thing, of course, is that Hawaiians consider Mauna Kea a very, very, very sacred place. It, it is. It is the pico. It is. Yeah. It is where you know Papa and Wakia came together to make yeah. life on Earth. It the, is the Earth, the Earth Father, and the and the, it's I mean, Earth, the Earth Mother, Mother and, and the Fa Sky Sky Father. Sky Father came together. Yes, that is the place they came together. So that will give our viewers some sense of how sacred it is. Yes. And then people come in and want to plop a big old telescope on there and then a mm -hmm. few more mm -hmm. that they pay a buck a year for, yes. and yet they earn millions of dollars for, yes. and nobody's richer for it except them, Yes. while desecrating once again the Hawaiian culture. Yes, exactly. Wonderful. <laughs> and so, that's where you guys come in. Yeah, so we've been, we've been advocating for it, just the implementation of the law is written. As the law is written, it's good. It protects Mauna Kea. It's just a matter of getting the university and the Department of Land Entry Resources to follow it. I mean, it's important to keep in mind that in 1968, the public agreed to have one telescope built on Mauna Kea. That's how it always starts. It's how it always starts. Yeah. And then it snowballed into that. Several telescopes were built without permits. And then whoa, whoa, whoa. Yes. several telescopes were built with, without permits. How in the world did that happen? Nobody was looking, basically. The public were were outraged, but the Department of Land Entry Resources didn't enforce the law. Holy and so smokes. after public pressure, a, a, a permit permits were issued retroactively for those and a few more telescopes were also built. And since then, um, the public really has put their foot down and drawn a line in the sand and all of those analogies to say that there's no more development, no further development of Mauna Kea. I know some Hawaiians are advocating to not only not let more being built, but take down everything that's up there. Yes, it should be. What do you think the chances of that um, achieving that are? I don't know what the chances are, but it's definitely something we'd be advocating for. The lease um, for the land on uh, top Mauna Kea um, closes on 2033, and the expectation is is that all the telescopes will be completely mo removed and the land will be remediated. What is it going to take for us to be able to remove all of those materials? Um, What's I don't the know. likelihood of it happening? It better happen, basically. Ah, I like your attitude. <laughs> I knew that's why we had, needed you on the show. <laughs> so, I mean, th that's the law, that's the agreement that we made, and we are not looking for having um, the telescopes can extend their stay uh, atop Mauna Kea. Um, it's really been a bad experience for, for Hawaiians and the public in general, uh -huh. and uh, we're, we're not interested in having them th there any longer. So, right. 2033 should be the end of that. Good. We'll mark our calendar. Yes, please do. We'll celebrate. <laughs> Good. So, Marty, you know, what is the what does the future of Hawaii look like? I mean, you guys are out there swinging away every day, and obviously, you're making some really, really great advances. Well, thank you. And have won some some victories. Um, yeah, I, th that's really the role that I see Kahea playing. Is that you know we are basically holding the line as best as we can uh, while while things for the future are, uh, are advocated for and improved. I mean. Hawaii is really at a crossroads. We have a very large population. We have very limited resources. People are beginning to recognize that we have a very um, delicate, vulnerable position because of our dependence on 
uh, imported food, imported oil, energy. It's very uh, precarious, isn't it? Very, very precarious. So, yeah. I mean, we're really at a crossroads. This is going to be the time where we can decide what kind of future we want to have in Hawaii. And, uh, you know, from, from the, the public that we interact with, the, the events that we go to, the classrooms, the students that we talk with, people are really interested in sustainability. They're really interested in sustainability in terms of food independence and food security. Yeah. Um, energy independence and energy stability, you know, security, and they don't want to see um, a, a, future, a future Hawaii that's all about extraction and taking, but more of a, a collaborative effort. And it's really the, the what's interesting to me is that what people are talking about is not sustainability in terms of just like this greenwashing sort of recycling. You'll feel better about yourself, yeah. but they're talking about a moral imperative to live in balance with the environment because the land and the people are related. They are one. And so goes the environment, so goes the people. And so if the environment is sick, and we're seeing that with contamination, with um, exploitation, the quarries, the landfills, the power plants, the military bombing, that, that's going to be our future as, as, a, as humanity if we allow the land to be desecrated that way. So people are really talking about a sustainability for all. And, and I think that's really important. That's, that's more of a... Um, a sustainability that um, has a moral imperative to it. Uh, and the reality is, is that Native Hawaiians as a group have really bared the burden of our unsustainable living practices up till now. You look at the communities where Native Hawaiians live, that's where the power plants are, that's where the landfills are, that's where the military practices are. And they are also suffering that health-wise as well. You know, you see increased rates of asthma, cancer, and, and those kinds of burdens on a population that really um, are unfair. And it's not to say that we want to advocate that, well, if you have one landfill in a Hawaiian community, you have to have one landfill in a Haole community. <laughs> that's not, that doesn't help us at all. It's instead that we really need to be advocating for sustainability for everyone. So it's not just about recycling, but it's about not having any waste, a zero waste program. Yeah, you know, it, it's really sick and disgusting because to have that near Hawaiians of all people because they're the ones that got it right for thousands of years. Yes, yes. Until, until the foreigners came in and screwed it up. Yes. Yeah, you know, this, I mean, what you're talking about here, you're right, it's, this is not about recycling aluminum cans. Right. This goes much, much deeper and wider. This is fundamental stuff. Right. And it's one thing, you know, to screw something up if you live on a big old continent like the United States of America. Yeah, you have but a little this, more room for air. Yeah, this is an island, and there's yes. only so much land and only so much resources, mm -hmm. and you have only so much time to get it right. Exactly. And then when you run out, you can't rerun the tape and go, oh, well, let's replay this and do this over. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But we really have an opportunity to be a model. I mean, like you said, Hawaii, you know, we only have a limited time to get it right. But when we do, we could really show the world how it's done. And you have island nations around the world who could learn from us, you know, Japan's having the same challenges. Um, Southeast Asia is having the same challenges. Even the United States, the continental U.S., could learn from what Hawaii could teach the world about how to live sustainably. And we have the tools to do it. We have beautiful growing season. We could be that place that has food security, that has ind energy independence, and has a sustainable environment that everyone can benefit from. Marty, now you've hit on what I think is the bullseye, the bullseye of bullseyes, the hmm. mother of all bullseyes. Hmm. Because Hawaii, you're right, Hawaii can be the model for the world. Yes. It can be that jewel in the Pacific. Mm. It can be that place that everybody else from around the world can come and go, we're coming here because we want to learn how to do it right because you guys are doing it right and we need to learn from you and take it back hmm. to our communities, our countries our nations right yeah that's I mean really that's what's at stake here isn't it as well as that's what the opportunity mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah so how do you see what so what part does Kahia play in all that well you know we're an advocacy organization we're a watchdog organization yeah. we really have an opportunity to pressure government um, local national government to make decisions that will encourage that so you know we're uh, totally supportive of innovative technology that uh, recognizes the power and beauty of nature and works with it as opposed to trying to harness it and control it. Uh, we really want to support initiatives um, in, in Hawaii that uh, improve the relationship between the people and the land and we really have an opportunity to advocate for that. People are constantly coming up with new ideas. We have many little startups all around Hawaii of, of uh, organic farming, mm -hmm. um, of sustainable living and these kinds of models, you know, we can bring those forward bring them to decision makers and say this is the kind of model we want to 
uh, encourage and you know these are the kinds of things you want to use your power to, to to have flourish in Hawaii as opposed to the extractive um, consumptive and really damaging types of um, yep. economic starters that the state legislature has really focused on in the past so yep so Mar Marty are you hopeful <laughs> for the future yes I am very hopeful like I said I, you know there's a lot of good things happening in Hawaii. A lot of people are working hard to overcome the immense obstacles of living sustainably in Hawaii. Yeah. And, and, and they're they being successful. Good, they? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's, it's amazing how much um, in the industrial push in Hawaii, the drive for profit and extraction has really um, altered the balance and relationship between people and the land. Uh, but people are overcoming that, and, and that gives me hope. Good, good. So. You know, our viewers, I'm sure, are sitting there going, wow, this sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. This is this is exciting. I've never heard anybody talk about it this way before. <laughs> so if somebody's sitting there at home listening to you, watching you, mm -hmm. and they want to know what, you know, like, what's my part? What can I do? Mm -hmm. I want to, you know, I'm excited now. I, I'm enrolled, but just tell me what to do. What would you tell them to do? Well, um, the first thing you can do is go, go to our, if you have access to the internet, you can go to our website. Um, www.kahea.org. That's K-A-H-E-A.org. Yep. Uh, we have a lot of resources there. Uh, you know, we, we don't take any federal funding. We don't take any corporate funding. So we really rely on donations to do the work. We also rely a lot on volunteer work. We have a wide variety of stuff that needs to be done. And a lot of it can be done regardless of where you are. I mean, we do a lot of remote teleconferencing type of things. We're really trying to use technology uh, to its greatest extent to, to help this effort. Yes, great. So, Marty, thanks so much for being on Voices of Truth. I know, you know, I've long been a fan of your organization. Thank I've long you very been much. in awe of what you do, what you guys do. Thank you. But to hear more, I mean, hear it from some, hear it coming right from, from <laughs> you know, from the source and and hear some of the, the background stuff. It's really exciting. Oh, Please thank you. keep up your work. Thank you very Please much. Please don't stop. You're an awesome go getter. Oh, thank you. So my request to you is keep going. We and will. Keep getting them. We will. Thank you very Great. much. Thank Great. you very thanks much for being on the show. Yes, my pleasure. wonderful. Long. Wonderful. Excellent. And thank you for watching Voices of Truth one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's Future. Brought to you by the Kiwani Foundation. Remember, you can watch us online 24-7. Watch us on the web on VoicesOfTruthTV.com. Also, our weekly video commentaries on FreeHawaiiTV.com. And of course, it's all part of the Free Hawaii Broadcasting Network. I'm Ehuke Kahu Cardwell for the Kiwani Foundation. And until next time, ahui ho!